This series was funded by great viewers just like you over on Patreon. Check out the description or end of the video to hear how you can take part in making the show even more amazing. Hey everyone, Kaijin Kumbi here, and welcome back to another episode of Witch Ninja! A series that looks at media's most popular show to see which are good and which are bad. So, are we really doing this? I mean, anime and gaming's typically our shtick, but Magic the Gathering? A card game of all things? I understand how skeptical folk may be about us really going out of our comfort zone to talk about a popular ninja in media, but two things. One, given the option, our patrons were pretty loud and clear about wanting to hear about Shinobi from one of the oldest tabletop card games in existence. And two, despite the fact that this game is the granddaddy of all card games, there's actually a lot you could say about the ninjas in Magic. But I'm sure at least half of you all are asking, what in the heck is Magic the Gathering? Well, to make a 25-year-old story short, Magic the Gathering is a game where two players having 20 points of life do get out by summoning creatures, casting spells, and in some cases, utterly breaking the meta for victory. There's five colors in the game. White, blue, black, red, and green. All representing various playstyles that come from them. But without a well-balanced breakfast of specifically colored lands to appease that chromatic sliver deck you just spent $300 on, you might as well flip the table, go home, and cry in the shower. But we're not here to talk about my introduction to buyer's remorse at the age of 16. We're here because one of the most recent sets to release in Magic, Modern Horizons, reintroduced into the game and introduced to me the concept of tribal ninja decks. Tribal decks meaning a card deck whose strategy revolves around one particular creature type. In this case, good old-fashioned ninja with a very particular ability, ninjutsu. Return an unblocked attacker you control to your hand. Put this card in the battlefield from your hand tapped and attacking. In layman's terms, if you're attacking your opponent and one of your creatures isn't being blocked, you can swap it out for one of your sneaky lads or lasses, each of which having a unique ability if you do damage to your opponent, such as drawing a card, looking at your opponent's hand, murdering opponent's summoned creatures, or outright playing creatures and spells from your opponent's deck or hand. Oh, I get it. Symbolically getting behind enemy lines in order to gain some kind of advantage. Alright, that's pretty ninja in a broad sort of way. Oh, but that's just the beginning. The more I dug into how this mechanic worked, the more red flags started going off in my head. And today, I want to go over some of the bizarre connections I found that are too numerous to be coincidental. First of all, color. Ninja creature cards in this game only come in two colors, blue and black, with eight cards being blue, seven cards being black, and four cards having both. A near perfect blend of both colors with slight blue dominance. Mix those two together and what do you get? Alright, well, I guess that's my cue. Real ninja bear blue. But more specifically, navy blue. Kind of ironic that Wizards of the Coast would designate the same color of their ninjas as the most normalized Shozoku Garba the Shinobi. For those of you wondering the reason why Ninja went with a dark blue instead of black outfit as we see so much in popular media, it's because black is really, really easy to see when contrasted against a lit night sky. Navy blue, however, not so much. Not to mention that Shinobi, for whatever reason, believed that the color itself repelled a whole host of insect and reptilian pests. Well, maybe not so ironic, considering Blue and Magic the Gathering strategizes card drawing, aka gathering resources, and stopping players from playing cards, or manipulation. While Black has a big focus in making your opponent discard cards, aka crippling their resources, and killing off your enemy's creatures, all of which Ninja did in abundance. Next, I admit this is 100% speculation, but there was something that I noticed with this ability that I just kinda couldn't get past. In order for the ninjutsu ability to take effect, aside from paying its cost, it has to come from an unblocked creature. Now, typically players will sometimes let smaller, weaker creatures deal damage to them while they use their own creatures to block heavier hitters. Only for those weak creatures to be replaced with ninja not only doing typically more damage, but also debilitating the opponent. I cannot help but think back to how ninja actually infiltrated their enemies in the first place. Granted, there are tons of ways that ninja got around without being noticed, but the most effective way was hiding in plain sight. Techniques like the Shichi Holde, or seven different occupations the ninja would disguise themselves as, allowed them to move from place to place without being stopped, harassed, or even given basic suspicion. Generally speaking, unless they were attempting to infiltrate a secure area, a ninja would make every effort they could to look as low-key as possible, keeping people's eyes off of them, only to strike when their enemies let their guard down. And when they did strike, they were either debilitating their opponent or gathering a resource or information at their enemy's expense. Now, let's look back at the game. 
Well, what's this? A simple 1-1 creature? Compared to what else is attacking me, one simple damage off of my health should be fine, except... Uh-oh! Oh! That 1-1 one -one just turned into a 6-5, and now not only are you losing a quarter of your health, but your opponent gets to play that insane dragon card you were going to toss down next turn. So yeah, masking your harder-hitting shinobi as simple harmless creatures seems pretty ninja to me. Huh. So on paper, the mechanics really do seem to follow more along the lines of traditional ninja doings rather than the stereotypical popular media concept. This idea that ninja were unstoppable warriors capable of taking out any number of enemies and ending them quickly. But that's on paper. What about the actual game? Well, for one, I can say from experience that these ninja creature cards have absolutely no raw power whatsoever. Unless you're talking about the Oni Ninja or the Nezumi Ninja cards, which, yeah, not really a thing in contemporary Japan. But as far as the human ninja go in this game, which makes up most of the cards, they're about as hard-hitting and durable as a wet shoji paper wall. Rarely sporting an attack higher than two and defense usually no more than three, ninja cards themselves are exceptionally lacking in combat capability. But that's how real ninja work. Because you see, aside from Shinobi Kachu plate armor and Kusari Katabita chainmail, which ninja rarely even wore anyway, ninja did not infiltrate or even go into combat heavily armed or armored. They couldn't. In terms of infiltration, a ninja had to be insanely flexible and lightweight to stealthily move around. So yeah, not much armor. And as for weapons, considering a ninja spends a lot of time climbing, sneaking, and so on, you can't exactly waltz around with a nodachi on your back, despite what other popular ninjas seem to do. So a ninja isn't exactly going to be heavily armed either. That isn't to say a group of ninja couldn't wipe out an unsuspected garrison of troops, but not in traditional hand-to-hand -hand combat they'd have to look for weaknesses and exploits. So yeah, the fact that Ninja and Magic the Gathering are really frail is comparable to how vulnerable Ninja really were in a combat scenario. Which leads me to my final deduction about this deck in action. After hitting up my local game store Madness and getting their help putting this Ninja deck together, which, by the way, big shout out to them here in the Dallas area for letting me get footage, I noticed something that set off yet another analysis flag. In this game, if your deck isn't moving fast enough to establish control early in the game, you're dead. Straight up, 100% dead. A prolonged game is a death sentence. By turn one, you need to have an unblockable creature like Changeling Outcast or Slitherblade and start setting your ninjas up to attack your opponents directly. By turn three or four, you need to have your ninjas hitting your opponent and either getting you resources or crippling theirs, because if your opponent gets enough creatures on the table or enough spells to wipe out your shinobi, you got nothing left unless you have a few tricks up your sleeve, which is basically what happened to real ninja that got caught off guard and or got stuck in combat. A ninja was well versed in martial arts to be certain. In fact, a hefty amount of modern day bujin kaninjutsu are lessons in hand-to-hand -hand self defense. But these techniques are about fast skirmishes and subduing your enemy quickly. If a ninja was caught up in a prolonged conflict, there would be very little that could save them from death or capture. As a lightly armed and even lighter armored scout, ninja would be no match against the arms and armor of a samurai battalion. Alright, well everything seems to be on the up and up when it comes to the broad scope of these tabletop ninja, but what about the individual cards themselves? Each of them has their own unique benefit tied to their ninjutsu ability. Granted, some of these creature cards include ninja rats and ninja... demons, but I would assume at least some of these cards would have some kind of connection to ninja history. Well, sure, not every ninja card in Magic has some tall tale behind it. Some of them are actually pretty straightforward. For example, the Ninja of the New Moon creature card, one of the hardest hitting ninja in Magic and the hardest hitting ninja in Modern Horizons, is the embodiment of one simple shinobi principle. In the Bansen Chukai, a collection of scrolls and knowledge that's been developed by the Kogan Iga Ninja for over 150 years, Volume 11 of Enin 1, or Hidden Infiltration, point 3 of 10 points to consider before a mission states, quote, You must consider the time of the rising and setting of the moon. It is best to infiltrate before the moon rises or after it sets. This is because moonlit nights are usually disfavored by those performing the art of Enin. But hey, guess what? A new moon means there is no moon, which in turn means that a ninja would be the most deadly when they have little more than personal lanterns to worry about when acting at night. As the card itself says, the knight is the greatest ally of all. Then there's the walker of the secret ways, which if this sassy kunoichi hits your opponent directly, you get a nice free look at their hand. I don't think I have to explain this one, guys. This is literally spying on what your enemy might be planning, which was the bread and butter job of the ninja. 
But if we had to put it into historical context, going back to the Bansen Shukai under Shochi 1, a guideline for commanders, quote, when a commander-in-chief uses shinobi, it enables him to know all about the defenses of the enemy's territory and its castles before he makes any plan, so that he will not be surprised nor will he fail, and all will be his plan, which is a great benefit. Again, I don't know if I have to put this any more plainly, guys. On turn two, you can look at your opponent's hand and know exactly what kind of deck they're using, their colors, and likely any strategy that they might be planning. Textbook ninja stuff. Speaking of textbook, the Moonblade Ninja and the Mist Syndicate Naga embody one of the most well-known and well-romanticized jutsus to have ever been practiced by Shinobi, the Bushin no Jutsu. Seriously, I don't know if there's been a single pop ninja that we've talked about where this doesn't come up. A uh, long story short, the Bushin no Jutsu, or Art of Division, was a Genjutsu illusionary technique to trick an enemy into thinking there was more than one of the same shinobi present. Some examples of execution include moving so fast that you trick a dim-witted enemy into thinking that you're in two places at once, though this one's really hard to prove, but there are a couple of others that do make a lot more realistic sense. In one example, the ninja could create straw men dressed in their attire and placed in strategic locations to trick any guards, creating illusions of their appearance similar to how the Moonblade Shinobi creates an illusion when it attacks. But more realistically, it could be possible that two or more ninja would dress in the same garb, looking identical, and moving with such coordination that an enemy would be easily tricked into thinking that that ninja had somehow mitosis itself into two beings. Exactly how the Miss Syndicate Naga creates exact copies of itself. You know, if you were to sit me down when I first started this series and told me that my old cardboard addiction actually had some subtle yet solid references to what ninja really were in it, I'd probably call you crazy. But after sitting back down with this game, putting this deck together, and playing out the mechanics, I gotta say I'm actually really impressed. Like 8 out of 10 stars impressed. Granted, Rat Ninja and Demon Ninja were never a thing, but the fact that I was able to spend 10 minutes blathering on and on about the real life connections that I found, and even more that could easily turn this into a 20 minute video, really does speak volumes about just how legit Ninja and Magic the Gathering of all things really are. But what do you guys think of these high fantasy shinobi? Is there more truth to them than meets the eye, or do you think it's just one huge coincidence? Let me know in the comments below, and a huge, huge thank you to all my patrons who keep Witch Ninja alive. I gotta say, I like your enthusiasm for having me check out Ninja outside the comfort zone of games and anime, but I don't think we should dawdle too long out of it. But I tell you what, if you're a hardcore Magic the Gathering fan, I got some good news for you. My buddy Chris Zito and I will be testing out some Magic the Gathering streams featuring some pretty ludicrous rule sets, like cracking open an entire box of boosters and putting together a deck based on what we pulled. So be sure to follow us both on Twitch to stay up to date on the ongoings of this project. But otherwise guys, thanks for watching. If you like learning about ninja, yokai, and other aspects of Japan through your favorite games and anime, and I suppose, yes, even card games, be sure to subscribe and keep an eye out for your sub feed to never miss out on our newest videos. In the meantime, I've got another trip to Japan to plan, so I'll keep you all in the loop about that as well. But until next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.